Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. This is the seminar in VLSI architecture for DNA sequencing and genome analysis. And we're hosting uh, Honor Mugu, who requires very little introduction, but still, Honor is a professor of computer science from EDH Zurich. That's uh, Albert Einstein, please, uh, alma mater. Uh, Honor is, co is also faculty member at CMU. He is uh, current uh, broader computer, uh, excuse me, research interests are in computer architecture, systems, hardware security, and bioinformatics. Ono received his PhD and MSc from the University of Texas in Austin. He started the computer architecture group at Microsoft, at Microsoft Research and held various product and research positions at Intel, AMD, VMware, and Google. He received the IEEE Computer Society Edward McCluskey Technical Achievement Award, ACM Seagark Maurice Wilkes Award, the inaugural IEEE Society Computer, Compu Computer Society Young Computer Architecture Award, Computer Architect Excuse Me Award, and a health number of other awards. Honor also received a large number of recognitions for test papers or topic papers at various computer architecture and security venues. He is an ACM fellow, an IEEE fellow, and well, in general, you know, uh, Honor is one of the most important computer architects of our time. So let's, uh, uh, this stage is yours, Honor, and let's start with your uh, great presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Leonid, and thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, to give this talk, as I mentioned earlier, uh, you can hear me okay, right? Can hear you great. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, it would have been much nicer if this were in person, but this is the second best we get, I guess. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, a different topic than uh, what I talked about last time I was there at Technion. Uh, I'm, to I'm, talk I'm going to talk about accelerating genome analysis. This is an area that we are increasingly working on right now, but we started about 13, 14 years ago, actually, while I was at Microsoft Research. And I'm going to give you more or less our personal journey on it. Uh, I don't intend to cover uh, all of the work that goes on in the area. Uh, we're going to focus on what I think is important, I think. Uh, and hopefully it'll be interesting still. And I, uh, I have a lot of slides. Uh, I understand it's, uh, we'll try to keep it to one hour, but uh, if, <laughs> if we go over, let me know. Uh, if, if you think it's going over too long, please let me know. So basically, uh, I believe system design uh, for bioinformatics today uh, is a critical problem. It has large scientific, medical, societal, and personal implications. And this talk is really about accelerating uh, a, a, a small part of it, a small but important part of it, uh, genome sequence analysis. And even within that, we're going to focus on something smaller but still important, uh, which is read mapping. And I'm going to talk about what it is. Uh, and uh, I believe there are many bottlenecks exist in accessing and manipulating huge amounts of genomic data during analysis. Uh, we will cover various recent ideas to accelerate read mapping. And I'll give you my personal journey since September uh, 2006 or so. And I will start with that, basically. Well, uh, basically, uh, this, this all got started uh, because uh, I had a collaborator at the University of Washington, John Alcon. And we were doing a bunch of hikes in the Seattle area at the time while I was at Microsoft Research. And uh, he, he works on genom genomics and I clearly work on computer architecture. And I didn't know a whole lot of genomics at that time. I still don't know a whole lot, I believe. Uh, but uh, we had this vision that would, it would be nice to have a simple, small embedded device that can perform comprehensive genome analysis in real time. Let's say within a minute, within a second, within 10 minutes, uh, basically something that can enable uh, difficult questions to be answered so that you can act on them extremely fast. And questions like this, basically, what is the gen likely genetic disposition of this patient to this drug so that I can potentially administer it in a very health critical moment, very quickly, without waiting for two days, right? What disease or condition might this particular DNA, RNA piece may be associated with so that I can quickly uh, do outbreak surveillance, for example, which is critically important today. And there may be many, many other questions. I'm going to give you some examples at the beginning of the talk for this. 
so let me first motivate the problem that we're going to focus on. It's going to be DNA or genome read mapping in general. Uh, and I'm not going to go through the biology of it. I, uh, I think everyone knows, uh, at least at a basic level, we have genomes, genes, and they consist of uh, base pairs, A, C, T, G. And it's clearly, it dictates a lot of things. Uh, DNA uh, gets transcribed into RNA and RNA uh, enables proteins in the end. And uh, they basically enable most of uh, our life in the end. And these are real, clearly. There are a lot of stories related to this, this Henrietta Lacks genome, uh, which violated a lot, a lot of privacy uh, issues, enabled us to understand a lot about human beings uh, today, at least in terms of genes, genetics. So the goal in DNA sequencing is to find the complete sequence of A, C, G, Ts in DNA, these base pairs in DNA, so that you can make sense of them and uh, correlate them with something else, like diseases, for example, or vulnerabilities or drugs, et cetera, or traits. Uh, the challenge is uh, there's no machine today that we have designed so far that takes long DNA as input and gives a complete sequence as output. Uh, all machines today are choppers. They chop DNA into pieces and identify these relatively small pieces with some error rate, not absolutely correctly, but they do not tell you how they fit together, how these pieces fit together. There are some relatively new technologies that give limited information about how these pieces fit together, but not complete picture. And they come at different cost uh, levels also. So genome sequencing essentially goes like this. You have large DNA molecule and you chop it into small DNA fragments of varying granularities, depending on the technology. And these lead to reads. We call these fragments reads. And then you try to map them somehow to reconstruct the genome. I liken this uh, to untangling yarn balls. If you have a cat that plays with yarn balls, you basically chop these yarn balls, one or more, into uh, pieces. And then you try to reconstruct the yarn ball. And these are the machines that deal with the yarn balls, basically. These are some examples over here. Uh, you can see some of them fit in your hand. Uh, and this didn't exist while we were dreaming, actually. We believed in the technology, and technology happened because people were working on it, clearly. And they're even smaller versions. But they're also very much more expensive versions of this, like uh, $1 million plus versions of it, like this one over here, uh, that can give you a much higher throughput with lower error rate. So they all have different characteristics. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. All produce data with di different properties. And these are some of the highest throughput sequencers that are out there today. And this slide still may be a little bit uh, outdated. Uh, so don't necessarily take my word for it. <laughs> Uh, but basically, uh, genomic era really started uh, with the Human Genome Project, uh, where a lot of investment was done uh, to sequence uh, the first uh, human genome. It took a lot of time. We, we still have not sequenced it completely, but at least we have a good confidence level. Uh, there are clearly a lot of issues with the human genome today also, uh, because it represents one human perhaps, right? Uh, but there are different kinds of humans. So people are actually trying to uh, are questioning essentially whether this human genome is enough for all of the studies we do. And that makes analysis even more complicated right now. Today, what we try to do is uh, when we get, when we sequence a DNA, a human DNA, we try to match it to the reference genome. But the question, uh, it, it's always good to keep the question in mind, is that the right reference genome uh, to match with? Uh, there may be multiple representations of different reference genomes going forward. But clearly a lot of investment was done uh, and uh, that was enabled. But today, we're in a much better point because the cost of genome sequencing has reduced. Sorry, my computer is new and has, is having some problems. I'll try to not touch whatever I'm touching. Uh, but basically, uh, the cost of genome sequence, uh, sequencing has reduced significantly with the development of new technologies. We're going to talk about briefly high throughput sequencing technologies and then later long read technologies like nanopore technologies. And these mark the inflection points in terms of the cost of sequencing. And you can see that Moore's law has reduced, has reduced transistor cost um, at a much lower rate uh, than uh, these new se sequencing technologies have reduced uh, sequencing cost, as you can see. As a result, we can sequence many, many genomes, whether they be human, viruses, animals. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, you pay less cost today, as you can see. And you can look, at the, look up these graphs. I have these. Uh, examples. So one of the biggest inflection points happened uh, in around 2000 or so, as you can see, or uh, 2005 or so, actually. Uh, it got widely adopted later on. Uh, and this is really high throughput sequencing. This is also called second generation or next generation sequencing, uh, which are not good names because there's always a next generation after next generation, right? Uh, 
uh, I call these high throughput sequencing, but that's not necessarily great also. How these machines work is basically uh, uh, they shine light uh, on things. They have a glass flow cell surface. They take DNA and chop it into really fine grained, very small pieces. They first amplify it and then chop it into fine grained pieces like 300 base pairs or so. Just for comparison, a human DNA is 3.2 billion base pairs. So you can see how fine grained they, these machines chop things into. Uh, and they basically uh, send the uh, chopped DNA into this glass flow, glass flow cell surface. And uh, the sequencer adds some molecule to the glass flow cell surface. And if a reaction happens with that molecule, they can basically tell uh, what the uh, base pair base is uh, that actually hits the glass flow sur cell surface. And this is a relatively accurate process. And you can see it's a very high throughput process. You can do this at high throughput. I'm not going to go into the detail. It's a still a statistical process. It's not perfectly correct. Uh, but the error rates today are relatively low. Uh, and if you're really interested, you can read papers that are written by Illumina and go to their website as well. Uh, so this is uh, the state of the art technology. Uh, they lead to small DNA fragments. Uh, it's high throughput, high speed, low cost. And unfortunately, they lead to very short reads. As I mentioned in the previous slide, 75 to 300 base pairs. And I'm not going to go through the slide in detail, but they, in the end, lead to low error rates. So 99% uh, of what you get is correct, but 1% is not correct, which means that you need to somehow overcome the incorrect information that you get. As a result, what practitioners do in the field is uh, they essentially uh, sequence not once, but many times. So basically, uh, they, they increase the coverage by 30x or so to overcome the error rates. And they build a confidence level in terms of what they're getting. And as I mentioned earlier, reads lack like information about their order and which part of the genome they originated from. So you have a computational problem to put together the small uh, 300 base pair fragments to get to 3.2 billion base pair genome. So essentially, uh, sequencing today is not a problem, I will say, unless, of course, you can always develop a better technology that can sequence the entire DNA, uh, entire genome. But I think that's very tough. And I'm happy to talk about this in detail, even though that's not my expertise. I think I find this fascinating. But technologies today are good enough to do a very high throughput job in a, a relatively quick time. But we're really bottlenecked by uh, the next steps, computational steps, essentially, which are which start with read mapping, and then we try to figure out what are the variants compared to a particular genome, and that limits our scientific discovery and potential medical advances. So let's take a look at some higher level questions before we go into the details of this. For example, uh, there may be questions that you may want to ask. You may want to align multiple different sequences together. If I give you a bunch of sequences, uh, you can ask the question, tell me where they're the same and where they're different. So this requires clearly chopping the DNA uh, or comparing different DNAs over here. And this is one of the, one of the examples that I like. Uh, it gives you the different complexity across different species over here. And clearly, we have similarities across humans, but we're very different in terms of characteristics. So we want to understand those. But we also want to understand different species differences. And this is one example study that was reported uh, in 2010s or so where uh, people have figured out single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are essentially simple differences uh, that you get in uh, DNA G sequences that lead to uh, probabilistic differences in blood pressure in different humans. So you can actually discover things like this, which is, I think, quite exciting. Uh, and uh, people do this through a genome-wide associated association study. So if you actually sequence a very large number of people, uh, you can, for example, distinguish uh, the correlating factors uh, for heart disease, uh, as this plot over here shows. But you can clearly do this for many, many things. Vulnerability to COVID, for example, could be one thing if we do enough sequencing and understanding uh, of the genomes. And uh, these SNPs, uh, bioinformatics is full of these uh, little words, which I don't necessarily like, but single nucleotide polymorphisms, these are basically single nucleotide differences. Uh, you, can, you can have, there are databases also that talk about uh, what people have found so far. And uh, it's fascinating to look at some of these. And there are also much larger structural variations that you may need to detect uh, after you actually put together a genome. For example, autism is correlated with a deletion that happens in one genome, uh, I think chromosome 16, uh, of 593 kilobits. And you can see there are other examples of this over here. And if you're interested, uh, I would recommend looking into this paper that was recently published. It talks about structural variation 
in, in more recent sequencers. And this, they talk about a lot of interesting studies as well as uh, the computational bottlenecks. Okay, there are other examples of uh, studies that could be very useful. I like metagenomics, for example, or genome assembly or de novo sequencing. These are enabled by asking a question that looks like this, basically. Given a bunch of sequences, maybe short some of them, uh, can you identify the approximate species cluster for genomically unknown al uh, or organisms? It could be a new virus, for example. And uh, people are interested in doing population scale profiling of microbiomes, basically. You randomly sample things around you, let's say, and you try to figure out what's going on in terms of infection or outbreaks or uh, essentially what kind of bacteria exist in what situations. Clearly, this is very data intensive because uh, whatever you can uh, uh, sequence is unlimited essentially here, right? Uh, but people do this sort of studies, for example, and reach interesting conclusions. I'm not going to talk about these higher level studies. Uh, clearly today, COVID-19 is important and uh, nanopore sequences, which we will talk about, were one of the first devices that were purchased by China and sent to China for outbreak surveillance and understanding the uh, genome of uh, COVID-19. And actually, I used the slide in my lecture, uh, which was face-to-face -face, uh, at the beginning of February. Uh, and I think there are a lot of studies that were later published that talk about uh, essentially uh, either testing or understanding the genome of COVID-19, which we still uh, need to do more about. But this is nothing new in a sense. Uh, in the past, people uh, use genome sequencing to understand other outbreaks. This is an interesting paper that was published in Nature in 2016 that talks about portable, portable meaning this thing over here at that time. <laughs> uh, you can basically portably carry out Ebola sequencing by taking these devices and these computers and uh, understand the genome uh, that you're dealing with. And I would recommend looking into these papers. Uh, but basically, I think uh, I, I motivate all of this because Clearly, we have some goal in the end in mind, whether it be scientific discovery or some med uh, medical advancement or some very practical question about uh, uh, what kind of thing, uh, what kind of drug should I administer to this person? Uh, we want to understand uh, uh, how, uh, how, how that relates to our understanding of the human genome. And today, sequencing is not a problem, uh, but analysis of that sequence data is a big problem. So I'll give you some examples over here. These were obtained in different times, but today the sequencing machine has very high throughput, but the computational analysis, even if you scale it up, is not as high throughput. This is one example. Uh, you can see some mappers that are used to uh, get to this value. Uh, and this is another example. Uh, if using one of the state-of-the-art machines, you can do 48 human whole genomes. You can sequence uh, these in about two days. At, you can see 30x coverage. You don't sequence a single genome once only. You do it 30 times or so. But then your bottleneck today, one human genome uh, takes about 32 CPU hours on a 48 core processor to analyze. And most of this time is really what we're going to talk about, which is read mapping uh, today. OK, so the problem is basically uh, all of these machines are choppers, which means that we need to reconstruct the entire genome from these many small fragments of the DNA that we get. And I, I, call, I term their reads, essentially. And I already showed you this picture. So we're going to try to make sense of these reads. So uh, there are two uh, things uh, that we can do with these reads. One is mapping these reads, which means that we want to align these reads to a known reference genome to detect matches and variations. The other is the no assembly. And this is a method of merging the reads in order to construct the original sequence uh, uh, without aligning uh, to a known reference genome. And you could do a combination of these uh, for understanding. But read mapping happens when you have a known reference genome like this, uh, or at least somewhat known reference genome. And you try to basically map these pieces that you get to reconstruct what you have in mind, uh, what, what, you, what you received from the sequencer. The novel assembly is you're essentially operating in the dark. You, you don't have a reference genome, but you try to match based on some characteristics that you know about these pieces such that you try to reconstruct the original sequence. I'm not going to talk about the Nova assembly, even though it's very, very interesting, clearly. Uh, but I think the algorithms are not really there yet to actually give us extremely good confidence over here. So usually when we do assembly today, you don't do it completely de novo, but you try to match it to some reference genome. And based on that, you try to actually uh, build some understanding of what you are dealing with uh, in the end. 
So in the end, I think assembly happens as a combination of read mapping and uh, somewhat what I showed you over here. Uh, so read mapping, in a sense, is the easier problem. I think assembly is the harder problem, but read mapping plays into the assembly problem also. OK, so essentially, let's go into more detail about read mapping. Essentially, what we're trying to do is we're trying to map many short DNA fragments or reads to a known reference genome with some differences allowed. So this is important because differences are natural uh, between different genomes, as we discussed. Not uh, no two DNAs of humans, uh, two different humans is different uh, the same, is the same. So DNA physically looks like this. We chop it into pieces, and we try to map those reads to a reference genome. And this is an approximate process to uh, begin with because each read has some errors, and reference genome may be different. So you need to actually have an approximate string matching uh, process uh, to enable this. And clearly, a single piece of read can map to many different places in the reference genome because you're looking at only 75 or 300 base pairs, right? OK, so metagenomic analysis very quickly uh, makes this even more difficult. I'm not going to talk a lot about metagenomic analysis, but they also, it also uses read mapping. In this case, reads from different unknown donors at sequencing time are mapped to many known reference genomes. So you may actually have genetic material that you recover directly from environmental samples, like we discussed with microbiome profiling, right? So you have a lot of reads. And then you basically map them to many different reference genomes databases to figure out where this material actually comes from. So clearly, this amplifies the problem because you do many, many, many read mappings in this case. If you have m reads then, and you have n different references, it's really m by n, uh, as you can see. And I'm not going to go through this, but again, fundamentally, it's built on read mapping. So if you look at the execution time breakdown of read mapping, let's say let's uh, go back five years, six years ago, it looked like this. Basically, most of the time was spent on what's called read alignments. This is the edit distance computation. Basically, you take a piece of text and you try to match it to uh, another piece of text that you have in the reference. And you try to uh, do this uh, approximate string comparison with some differences allowed. So most of you probably are familiar with edit distance. Uh, essentially, it's defined as the minimum number of edits uh, that are needed to make the read exactly match the reference segments. And these edits can be of different types, insertions, deletions, or substitutions, all of which have different kinds of biological or medical meanings, actually. So you really need to capture whether an edit is an insertion, deletion, or substitution, because they actually are meaningful uh, depending on their type. So this is one example of edit distance computation between Netherlands, uh, the, the text Netherlands and the text Switzerland. As you can see over here, uh, there are two mismatches to begin with. There's a deletion over here in, uh, in the Netherlands uh, uh, that exists in Switzerland. So in this case, Switzerland is a reference. Netherlands is a read. So in the read, there's a deletion, as you can see. And then there's a match. And then there's another mismatch. And then Erlens are over here matching completely. And then there's a, an insertion that happens in Netherlands that doesn't exist in Switzerland over, over here. So if you have a good edit distance computer, it would, uh, it would basically find out that you have three mismatches, one deletion, and one insertion. It would give you exact locations, because these exact locations are important for, for example, whether you have high blood pressure or not, right? So OK, there's, uh, what are the key challenges in read mapping? First of all, to be able to not miss anything, we need to find many mappings of each read. We need to be comprehensive, basically. A short read may map to many locations, especially with high throughput DNA sequencing technologies. The key question is, how can we find all mappings comprehensively efficiently? Uh, we need to tolerate small variances and errors in each read. It's not an exact matching process. Exact matching is easier, clearly. But uh, actually, each individual is different. Subjects' DNA may slightly differ from the reference, as you can see. How can we efficiently map each read with up to E errors present? Of course, the question is, what is E? Usually, people look at 5% or 2% uh, differences. But uh, there's no consensus in the field, as far as I know, in terms of what should be the E. Some people actually argue for we should be finding differences uh, or matches as close as within 10% different uh, texts. Uh, but I think a good mapper, I believe, in the end, uh, should be configurable enough to go up to scale up to larger E's. But today, none of the mappers that we have designed scale up to very large E's. Uh, and then uh, finally, you need to map each read very fast. Of course, performance is important. You have millions to billions of reads, especially because you need to have high coverage. And state-of-the-art mappers can take weeks to map a human's DNA. This is an old slide, by the way, some of, uh, some of the mappers. Depending on how comprehensive you are, depending on the value of E over here, and depending on whether or not you're missing anything, 
You may not take weeks. You may take very quickly, actually. Some of the mappers that are used in the field are missing a lot of information. As a result, uh, they can be quicker than what I describe over here. But our goal is to be comprehensive at the, at the same time efficient. So the key question is, how can we design a much higher performance read mapper? OK, before we go into the mapper design, very quickly, let's talk about uh, the read alignment, which is a dynamic programming problem. So you have two pieces of text over here, and you want to find all differences, uh, the minimum number of edits, uh, and you want to find the different edit types. And to be able to do that, uh, you really need to build a dynamic programming table. Uh, and this leads to uh, significant uh, slowness, let's say. You have data dependencies in the computation. I'm not going to uh, go through dynamic programming right now. Uh, but you, you, you need to compute entire matrix, even though strings may be dissimilar. So if you go back to the Netherlands versus Switzerland picture over here, you basically fill up the matrix first uh, somehow. And it takes time and space. And then you need to backtrace uh, to figure out uh, what is the minimum and what are the different kinds of edits that you need to do to Netherlands such that it matches Switzerland with the minimum number of edits. So it's quadratic time because you need to enumerate all possible prefixes while you're doing this. And again, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, dynamic prog uh, probably most people who are here have seen dynamic programming. Uh, I'm not going to go through this paper also, but we have recently surveyed uh, read mapping algorithms and techniques uh, that were published in the last 40 years, uh, well, 35 years or so, let's say. Uh, and there are a lot, actually, and they all have different categories. And if you're really interested, you can take a look at the survey, which is currently under review in a journal. OK. So that was kind of the background. So let, now let's go into uh, state-of-the-art read mapper design and how can we accelerate it. So read mapping algorithms uh, usually come in two styles. Uh, one is hash-based seed and extent, and the other is burroughs wheeler transform and indexing-based aligners. And these have actually a lot of similarities, although I'm, go I'm going to talk about the first one because first one uh, is very comprehensive today. And I'm going to talk about how they actually uh, work. Uh, they essentially do some pre-processing of the genome. And they create an index of the genome using a hash table. And then when you get a read, you basically index into this hash table and you find the potential location of a small piece in the read. And then you extend through alignment. Essentially, this is called seed and extend. You uh, index the hash table using the seed and get potential locations. And then you try to see if the full read matches the reference genome in any of those locations. It could be all of those locations also. Basically, the search is uh, all possible locations that are indexed. So it's more sensitive, but it's very slow also. And it requires large memory, but this can be reduced with some tricks. So other uh, read mapping algorithms uh, operate in a different way. They basically use some compression method to compress the genome index. And they're actually optimized for perfect matches usually. You can find the perfect matches very quickly. But uh, imperfect matches, you need to do a lot of work. Basically, these are not very sensitive. So as you increase the uh, value e, these become extremely slow. Uh, and some uh, hash based season extend methods actually surpass these algorithms as you increase E. And our goal is actually in to, to be able to scale to larger E's as much as possible. So these need to reduce sensitivity, but they're employed in the field a lot because usually people do not exactly know what they're missing uh, when they do not look at uh, a larger E. OK, so let's go into this hash table based read mappers and uh, let's go through an overview of it. So as I said, the key idea is we pre-process pre the reference into a hash table and use this hash table to map reads. Pre-processing is very simple. And this is based on uh, the first work that we published in the area in 2009. Essentially, to pre-process uh, the genome, you basically create k-mers, or strings of length, length k. And you basically represent where in the reference genome the string of length k appears. And essentially, you can, you can form a hash table. right? So for example, a string that consists of all A's appears in these locations in the reference genome. So you have a location list uh, associated with this entry in the hash table. And you keep doing this for every single, every possible uh, entry in the hash table. So clearly, it's a big uh, hash table over here. Uh, and uh, you can, you're comprehensive, hopefully, because you process the entire reference genome. And you can do this in an overlapping manner and non-overlapping manner. Overlapping manner usually leads to higher accuracy, but I'm not going to go through those details. But this is essentially an index into the reference genome using a hash table, and you do it once for a reference. And then when you actually uh, sequence uh, a genome, you get a bunch of reads. This is one example of read. For example, you can see that there's 40, 36 uh, base pairs in this case. 
and you divide it into k-mers. You can uh, index into the hash table width. And the hash table gives you the, K uh, the locations associated with each k-mer. Right? K-mer is 12-mer in this case. Basically, you have 12 bases uh, in each string. And then what you do is essentially go through a serial process, uh, at least in the non-optimized version of the, ha uh, of the mapper. You basically uh, say, OK, uh, all A's appear in this location. I'm going to fetch the reference genome starting from that location. I'm going to fetch 36 bases and then see if my read actually matches those 36 pages, uh, bases. And in this case, it looks like a perfect match. This is called a local alignment. So you basically do a distance computation in the, each location that you encounter. And you do the local alignment, and you see that it matches in this case. So that's great. You said this is a valid mapping in this case. OK, you, then you go to the next location, uh, bring the reference genome in the next, starting from the next location, 36 base, bases, and then compare it to the read. You can see that it's very different, even though the first 12 bases match, the remaining 24 bases don't match. As a result, you get an invalid mapping. You say that uh, there's no match in this location, so I'm not mapping in that particular place. And you keep doing this for every single location uh, to comprehensively map the read to the reference genome. You can see that for every read doing this takes a lot of time. And imagine doing this for billions of reads that you have, and that's going to be a lot. But in the end, this guarantees you to find all mapping, so it's very sensitive. And when we uh, and it can tolerate up to E errors. Of course, it becomes slower as E increases. Uh, but uh, we, we showed that this is actually validated with experimental data uh, that comes from real uh, wet lab uh, studies. So this, uh, this actually can find uh, 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 segmental duplications or copy number variants uh, relatively easily. And you can read the paper for more detail for that. But of course, this is slow. Our goal was not to be slow. Our goal was, was to be fast. Uh, so we're going to tackle that in the remaining part of this uh, lecture. So clearly, uh, the reason this is slow is we're doing alignment on every single possible location. Basically, alignment or edit distance computation requires a memory access to the reference genome and many base, where pi base pairwise comparisons between the reference and the read edit distance computation. As a result, about 95% of the execution time of read mapping is spent on edit distance computation. So our goal is going to speed up the mapper by reducing the cost of this verification or alignment. And basically, we're going to eliminate most of those alignments to be able to do this. And that's our overarching key idea. Can we somehow get rid of this edit distance computation as much as possible and do it only when we really, really, really need to do it? And this leads to a hierarchical or two-level mapper. First level is a filter. So we would like to filter fast before we do this alignment so that we do the alignment only when it's absolutely necessary and we have confidence that we have to do it. And this is also, uh, you can also uh, give the key idea as minimizing costly edit distance computations or approximate string comparisons. OK, so I'm going to go through some techniques to enable this. But we recently were invited to write this paper uh, that is relatively short uh, to discuss uh, different techniques for doing this. And I invite you to take a look at that, because I'm not going to cover everything that is covered in this paper. And this paper has a lot of references uh, to work uh, that is beyond what I, what I intend to cover also. OK, so let's start with uh, algorithmic acceleration. And then we're going to go into hardware software co-design and hardware acceleration. Any questions so far? Otherwise, I will keep going. Feel free to interrupt me if there are questions. OK, so I'm going to start with the first filter that we have designed, uh, because we're going to do filtering, essentially, to, uh, so that we don't do these costly edit distance computations. And the idea is, to, is that you could do this filtering very, very quickly. If you can do it very, very quickly, you can quickly answer the question, oh, this read is not going to match in this location. So don't even bother doing, doing the edit distance computation. Of course, this filter has to be very quick, right? If this filter takes a long time, then you're really uh, doing the wrong thing. And this is the first filter that we developed. We call it FastHash. And uh, basically, the observation is that most of these edit distance calculations are unnecessary. Uh, one out of 1,000 potential, potential locations actually pass the alignment meaning uh, within, within a given error rate. And we observed that you can get rid of unnecessary alignments uh, by detecting and rejecting early invalid mappings. That's called filtering. And also reducing the number of potential mappings to examine. I'm going to talk about both ideas. Let's talk about the first observation. Essentially, the first observation really exploits the structure of the reference genome. And the idea is, if, if uh, k-mers in a read are adjacent in the read, 
they should also be adjacent in the reference genome, meaning that you can, you can actually see uh, index the hash table and figure out if adjacent k-mers or uh, substrings in a read uh, are actually adjacent in the location lists that you get from the hash table. And if they're not adjacent, then you, can, you don't need to access the reference genome at all. You can say, based on the, pre based on the processing in the hash table, you can say, I, I confidently can say that these three, uh, let's say, uh, k-mers are not adjacent. So read mapper can quickly reject mappings that do not satisfy this property. I'm going to give you a pictorial example of this also. Uh, but this gets rid of a lot of the uh, edit distance alignments. So it's and, a one-way property. You care uh, about correct rejection. You care less about false acceptance. Of this absolutely, point. absolutely, yes. Okay. Uh, although you do care about false positives in the sense that uh, false positives are, uh, you, uh, are not bad for correctness, uh, as you, uh, yeah, I think as you're getting at. But of course, they ex affect your uh, processing time, right? You, don't yeah, want, yeah, you sure. still want to minimize false positives yeah. because you'll be doing double uh, I shouldn't say double, but you'll be doing filtering mm -hmm. plus the alignment on them, right? <laughs> so absolutely, uh, false positives don't affect correctness. Uh, and then the second observation is that some, some k-mers, meaning substrings, are actually cheaper to verify, cheaper to align than others, because they have shorter location lists, meaning they occur less frequently in the reference genome. And a mapper actually needs to examine only E plus one substrings in a read to tolerate E errors. This is the pigeonhole principle, if you will. And the read mapper can intelligently choose the cheapest E plus one substrings to verify their locations. It doesn't need, uh, basically it can be intelligent in terms of which substrings in a read it can uh, choose in the reference genome. So I'm gonna give you a pictorial of both of these ideas. Uh, one is called adjacency filtering and the second is called cheap camer selection. And when I say camer, uh, you, you can automatically translate that into a substring also. I actually like the substring better, but KMERS is very commonly used in bioinformatics, so we use KMERS. So basically, adjacency filtering detects and filters out invalid mappings at early stage. The key insight is that for a valid mapping, adjacent KMERS in the read are also adjacent in the reference genome. So if you look at the read over here, these are the three KMERS that I showed you earlier. For a valid mapping, let's look, let's look at exact matches first. Uh, valid mapping, the adjacent KMERS should be adjacent in the reference genome. You can see that if this KMER is not adjacent to the next k-mer, there are not valid mappings over here. So you can quickly find out that these are all invalid mappings because k-mers are not adjacent in their location list. But you can quickly also find out that this is a potentially a valid mapping because k-mers are close enough in their adjacent list. So basically, the key idea is to search for adjacent locations in the k-mers location list. If more than e k-mers fail, there must be more than e errors, which means that you have an invalid mapping. You don't need to do the edit distance computation. And given that about one out of a thousand mappings are invalid uh, because of the way uh, things happen to be, uh, because of the way hash tables constructed and the characteristics of the reference genome, you can eliminate a lot of computation as we will see. Okay, I've given you the basic idea, but pictorial, it looks like this. You basically take the first substring, all A's. It says, look, it says it starts at location 12. You take the second substring after that, you expect that it starts at location 24. And you basically check whether the second substring has an entry of 24 over here. If it does, then maybe there, uh, this read uh, exists in that location. And then you basically ask the question whether the third substring uh, exists in location 36. And it does, as you can see over here. Then you basically say, OK, I'm going to do the alignments. Potentially, you can also get rid of the alignment. But with the error rates, uh, Usually, it's not easy to get rid of complete alignment. And also, you need to do complete alignment for a different reason, which is you really want to get the uh, different kinds of uh, single nucleotide poly polymorphism SNPs, essentially. So in the end, you need to do the alignment. But you can see an, a rejection over here. Uh, the, uh, if uh, the second uh, location, uh, the, the first substring appears that is 324. The expected location of the second substring is 336. And because 336 doesn't exist in the location list, in fact, nothing close to 336 exists. As a result, you can quickly say uh, the read doesn't exist in this particular location and don't do the alignment. And you can skip essentially a lot of alignments this way. OK. The second one is chief camera selection. Very quickly, the idea is Quick question. Yes. You say that it's not even close. Doesn't exist, not even close. Yeah. Does close have any meaning? So that's a good question, I think. Uh, I think depending on the error types and error rates you examine, close may have a meaning. Uh, meaning uh, there could be some insertion that happened between these two uh, different, 
uh, substrings, right? So it really depends on what kind of error types you're looking at. Very good uh, question. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I can add one thing, sorry for the interruption. Um, sure. Isn't this essentially kind of a similar to, let's say, uh, just increase the Cayman size and that's it? Like, wouldn't be like, <laughs> yeah. So I think that's, a, that's also a good question. Uh, it's not exactly for two reasons. One is increasing the Cayman size really increases the table size a lot, uh, your memory size, because uh, it's exponential, as you can see. It, it, it's an order of two. Uh, it's essentially a power of two, right? Uh, but the second thing is, uh, errors that happens in indexing uh, is a problem sometimes. So is, if you increase the Kamer size, uh, sometimes you may miss the errors that happens in the indexing of the hash table. And the construction of the hash table may become difficult if you actually take, start taking into account errors that happens in the Kamers. Thanks. Sure. But there's, some, there's actually a, a lot of interesting literature that we reference in terms of uh, the Kamer size that you need to select for a mapper like this in the in the survey, survey article that I mentioned earlier. So if you're interested in this, you can take a look at the survey article. OK, the second idea, again, very quickly, these are software-based mechanisms, as you can see. The second idea is to reduce the number of potential mappings to examine. And the key insight is uh, these substrings have different costs to examine. Some Kamers are cheaper because they have fewer locations than others. They occur less frequently in the reference genome. And we want to sort the Kamers based on their number of locations and select the Kamers with the fewest number of locations to verify, essentially. And if you look at this example, we have a read that's longer in this case. And we have an error rate that we want to tolerate at most two SNPs. And we, we want to examine at least three Kamers in this case to be able to tolerate that error rate. And this Kamer happens to have locations, only four locations. And you can see that some of them are popular in the reference genome. It has 2K, 1K, 1K locations. So in this case, it makes sense to examine only the cheapest three Kamers to be able to map the read with uh, the error rate over here. But expensive Kamers, as you can see, are very expensive. So if you're unlucky, the previous work, which doesn't take into account Kamer cost uh, to examine the locations, can examine 3,004 locations. Whereas if you're intelligent, you can basically uh, examine, get away with examining only eight locations uh, in the reference genome. So this is sometimes called seeding also. Uh, I think of this seeding and filtering as similar steps. But you can also think of this as which seeds do you select uh, to seed into the reference genome? OK, uh, I'm not going to go through the methodologies over here. This is a relatively old study also. It's about eight years old now. But when we did these studies, we used state-of-the-art machines. And we looked at uh, clearly interesting uh, real read sets. And basically, we find out that uh, these two ideas, when combined together, can lead to significant speed ups in terms of uh, uh, the mapping performance. It can speed up the mapper by 20x. And you can see that there's variance depending on uh, what genome you're examining. And uh, the reason mainly is because we're not doing edit distance computation in, in we're reducing the edit distance computation by about 100 X uh, or so, uh, as you can see over here. But we're not completely getting rid of all of the edit distance computations we should really get rid of. You can see that there's still uh, some edit distance computations that we can get rid of over here. But we're getting most of, rid of most of them. OK, so this is the conclusion. Since uh, given the interest of time, I'm not going to go through these conclusions in detail, but you can read the slides uh, when you have them. But these two ideas are actually implemented in many mappers, uh, whether they're hash, and, uh, hash table based or uh, the different kinds. And I think it makes sense to implement uh, this sort of ideas. But let's go into some more interesting ideas. This is really exploiting the structure of the human genome to design better software, let's say. But can we actually uh, do that plus? accelerate things uh, to be much better. And the next thing we looked at was actually look at whether we could exploit SIMD instructions to improve the accuracy, uh, improve the speed of the filtering that we do. And we call this a shifted Hamming distance. I'm going to quickly introduce the concept. Basically, uh, the key observation is that if two strings differ by E edits, then every base pair match can be aligned in at most two uh, E shifts of one of the strings. So this may be cryptic, but I'm going to show you uh, a pictorial view. Basically, the insight is that shifting a string by one location corrects for one error. And then you can do a Hamming distance computation between these different strings. So the key idea is to compute what is called the shifted Hamming distance, which is really an end, bitwise end, of two E Hamming distances of two strings to filter out invalid mapping. So we use bit parallel operations that nicely map to SIMD instructions, which also turn out nicely uh, can be instantiated on FPGAs as well. The key result is that this filter uh, shifted timing distance filter is about 3x faster than the best implementation of 
uh, the famous uh, Gene Myers bit vector algorithm that's used as a filter uh, with only a very small false positive rate. And this is really the fastest CPU-based uh, pre-alignment mechanism as far as I know still today, but maybe I'm, my information is out of date. So if you have any information that uh, to the contrary of this, please let me know. But let's take a look at what we're doing uh, at the heart of it. Essentially, we're going to align two strings. Uh, this is one of my favorite cities in the world. Uh, basically, uh, the Hamming distance of these two strings, Istanbul and Istanbul, uh, is clearly a bitwise comparison, right? Well, uh, characterized comp comparison in this case. You have eight matches in this case. Now, let's say, take a look at what happens if there was one deletion, uh, deletion of A in the second string. Now, if you compute the Hamming distance, assuming you do padding, of course, you get only three matches and five mismatches, which is clearly bad, right? You're clearly not matching in this case. But to cancel the effect of this deletion, you can shift the second string by one to the right. OK, you do one Hamming distance comp uh, computation between these two. And then to cancel the effect of the deletion, you shift the second string by one character to the right, and then do the Hamming distance again with enough padding, of course. Now what you get is three matches in the first one, four matches in the second one, and then one mismatch, clearly. Now it looks much better. right? That's the idea, basically. So to be able to overcome the effect of deletions, you do shift to the right. To be able to overcome the effect of insertions, you shift to the left, clearly. And to tolerate enough number of errors, for example, you need to tolerate three errors, uh, character errors, you shift to the right three times, and you do the Hamming mass of those three different shifts. So OK, I've already given you the idea, basically. You do two Hamming distance comparisons in this case. These are simple XORs. And then you end what you get. And then you count the ones that you get in the resulting, uh, uh, let's say, uh, aggregate ha Hamming distance computation string. In this case, there's only one one. And if it's below a threshold, you say that, OK, these are close enough. If it's above some threshold, you say, these are far enough. I'm not going to do the edit distance computation. That's the idea, basically. And these bitwise operations can be extremely fast, as you can imagine and SIMD processors. So what we're doing pictorially is very uh, clearly, we're not doing dynamic programming. But what we're doing is uh, uh, these are the two strings. And uh, in the matrix that we show over here, uh, you can see that uh, the yellow part is really the Hamming distance without shifting. And uh, you have a Hamming distance mask. If you go to the above diagonal, you get a one deletion Hamming distance mask. And if you go one more, you get a two deletion. If you go one more, you get a three deletion. You can, you can actually do a lot of these deletions. And if you go to the bottom, as you can see over here, those are the insertion uh, masks, Hamming masks. And then you can do this computation nicely through this matrix. It's, it's essentially a bitwise end, or, or sorry, XOR, uh, plus, and then an end uh, of those elements. And you can see that we got rid of all the data dependencies that way. What's the yeah. difference between insertion to one versus deletion in the other? So it's the same thing, basically. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you could actually do it the, uh, the other way around also. Okay. The, the, reason, uh, the reason why I do it this way is because I, I, I think of reference as fixed and query as the input. Ah, OK. Yeah, that's okay. the reason. <laughs> OK. OK, so the key idea, I think hopefully it was clear. And this is the full picture. I'm not going to go through this in detail. Uh, but clearly, this is the Hamming mask. And then you have a one deletion mask uh, by, uh, by shifting, the, uh, shifting the query to the right. And then you have two deletion masks, three deletion masks, one insertion, two insertion, three insertion, et cetera. And then in the end, you end all of them. Uh, and there may be some errors, some issues that you get. Unfortunately, you need to correct for them because this is not perfect, clearly, right? Uh, you, uh, you, you may get mismatches also, et cetera. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about those in detail. So there's some amendment process that we employ. Uh, which actually leads to inaccuracy in this, which we're going to correct later on. Uh, and inaccuracy increases as, your, as the size of the string actually increases, uh, because now you're actually accumulating the errors that you get uh, because of the large size. But in the end, you get this n mask. And basically, you compare how many ones do you have to a threshold that you uh, determine. And if it's greater than that threshold, you say, these are too dissimilar to each other. I'm not going to do the alignment. OK, I've already uh, discussed this, but clearly, Alignment is expensive, as we discussed. It's dynamic programming. Needleman Munch is one dynamic programming algorithm. We basically get rid of the data dependencies. But our goal here is not align alignment. Basically, we're taking the liberty because we're doing filtering, which can, which can be approximate. As Sai said, we can tolerate false positives over here. As long as we don't get false negatives, that's great. <laughs> and we prove, in this case, that we don't get false negatives 
meaning that we don't miss any potential alignments. And the good thing is, because we don't have any data dependencies, now uh, we can actually employ this on many different types of technologies. And uh, clearly, SIMD hardware is one example, but we're going to see that uh, on FPGA hardware also, which is going to be much faster. OK, so this actually, after this uh, shifted Hamming distance, new bottleneck really becomes filtering. So let's recap a little bit. Sequencing generates many reads, each of which potentially maps to many locations. Filtering eliminates the need to verify or align reads to invalid mapping locations. And alignment happens only on reads that pass the filter. And new bottleneck in read mapping essentially becomes a filtering or pre-alignment step uh, because alignment is not performed heavily anymore. OK, so if you're interested, uh, we actually released all the source code of all of these uh, mechanisms and uh, people built on it. But we're happy to support it also if people are interested in working on these. OK, so this was uh, what I consider algorithmic acceleration in a sense. What, uh, what we're going to cover next is going to be hardware acceleration. But this doesn't mean that algorithms are not going to change also, because it's really going to be algorithm architecture co-design in many of these cases. Uh, so I think we, I've already covered this, actually. I'm not going to talk about this more. But essentially, there are two ways to improve the performance of the mappers, improving the performance of filtering and optimizing the uh, alignment and uh, accelerating the alignment also. And both methods are actually used by mappers today. But filtering has replaced alignment as the bottleneck. And now we're going to try to improve filtering. So uh, what do you need in a filter? You've discussed this already, but very quickly. Uh, you want to filter out all incorrect mappings, and you do not want to filter out any correct mappings, clearly. Correct defined as approximate string match, matching that happens with some error rate. And in the end, you want to be faster than the mapper, right? Uh, and much faster than the mapper itself. So we've already seen this picture, shift the timing distance, got rid of data dependencies. And it turns out with simple changes to shift the timing distance, which I'm not going to talk about in detail, you can map it to an FPGA. And once you map it to an FPGA, you get an order of magnitude improvement uh, in performance. Again, I'm not going to go through the details of this particular uh, paper. It's, we call it Gatekeeper. Uh, as far as we know, this is the first FPGA-based filtering uh, algorithm. And uh, you can read the paper for a lot of details, but we can actually sustain maximum data throughput. And we actually use a very small part of the FPGA because in the end, we're bandwidth bottlenecked uh, to main memory. Uh, and we can actually support, you can see, 5% error rates uh, with very good performance. Uh, you can see the analysis in the paper. And there are some differences that you need to uh, take into account when you're mapping a shift to timing distance to FPGA as opposed to uh, uh, small vectors, let's say, in, in SIMD or SSE architectures, for example. But I'm not going to go through these in detail. And we also change the algorithm a little bit to uh, reduce the false accept rates. So in the end, FPGA leads to a much faster filter. And it leads to a significant speed up in read mapping also. And uh, you can also download it and see it. OK, so basically, now we're going into hardware uh, support more, uh, which will bring up higher speed ups. And one of the interesting things over here is I think a lot of these uh, hardware support can actually be integrated with the sequencer also. So while you're sequencing, you can do some analysis as well. And this could also help hide the complexity and the details of the FPGA from end users, potentially. And it could also enable real-time filtering while sequencing. And this will, I think, become even more interesting when we talk about small-sized embedded sequencers like Nanopore. OK, so we later designed another FPGA that improves the accuracy, because accuracy is a concern when you're looking at longer matches. But I'm going to tackle that uh, in the next work in a little bit. So the key question is, can we do better? better? Of course, we want faster. But we also want more accurate filtering without making it slower. And we want more scalable filtering, filters that actually improve as E becomes larger. So in the end, we need to do algorithm architecture co-design, uh, device co-design. I'm going to talk about this work quickly and another work that we recently published. Uh, I like the ideas in these because they're really algorithm architecture co-designs. And uh, the key insight in Shuji, Shuji means a sliding door in Japanese. Uh, essentially, correct alignment always includes long identical subsequences. And if we process the entire mapping of a read at once, uh, it leads to uh, less accuracy, uh, as we will see in a little bit. The key idea over here is to use an overlapping sliding window when we do this matrix computation in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of differences between the substrings uh, so that we can quickly and accurately find all segments of consecutive zeros. Because that's our goal, if you remember the earlier slides. We want to find substrings of consecutive zeros and 
if the consecutive zeros are greater than some fraction uh, in the entire uh, uh, zero or binary string that we have in the end, then we say that let's do the alignment for that. So we want to do this accurately. And actually going through going to finer granularity windows leads to higher accuracy. Let me give you the key results. This leads to, uh, compared to the best uh, CPU read aligner, it leads to significant speed up, as you can see over here, about 18 to 19 X. And actually, a FPGA algorithm is much faster than the CPU algorithm. And it's also much more accurate than the previous algorithms because we're going to look at smaller windows. So let's take a look at what the idea is. So we build the neighborhood map. Neighborhood map is exactly the same as what we discussed. Uh, all of these masks that we discussed this is the Hamming mask. And then one deletion mask, one insertion mask. You can see up to, I think, three deletion and three insertion masks over here. You build it. You don't need to build the entire thing because clearly, after some insertions and some deletions, you don't care. And then you look at a sub window of it. So, a window of size of four, let's say, in this case, uh, on the x axis. And you find all the common subsequences, meaning diagonal segments of consecutive zeros that are shared between the two given sequences. Uh, sequence in this case are small sequences over here. Let's take a look at how it works. Basically, you look at all the diagonals and you find out the diagonal that leads to the highest number of zeros. And you can see clearly that the yellow one over here has four zeros and everything else has smaller than four zeros. Now we have four over here. And what we do is we take that value, zero, 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 and give it, uh, basically feed it into this bit vector over here. And then we move into the next overlapping window, exactly do the same thing. And this gives you a three over here along this diagonal, as you can see. And then we do essentially the same thing, record it over here. And then you keep doing it until you fill it out. And this leads to a, very, a much more accurate number of ones that you get over here because you're doing it in a piecemeal basis as opposed to ending everything that you see in the entire vector uh, uh, in, in, e in either dimension, uh, in, in, in either dimension, basically. So this increases the accuracy because you accept if and only if the number of ones is less than or equal to threshold. And the number of ones that you get with this overlapping sliding window algorithm is much more accurate than what we discussed earlier with shifted timing distance. And of course, then the question becomes, what is the effect of that sliding window size? There's a lot of discussion in the paper. It needs to be large enough to accurately capture longer streaks of matches so that you get lower false positives. But it also needs to be small enough to perform fast computation uh, and also uh, yeah, uh, essentially, uh, there are also other trade-offs that I don't go into over here. But if your window size is very small, you get a lot of false positives. If your window size is four, your false, false positive rates becomes very small, as you can see. And we actually have some more results, but uh, it's not plotted over here. And then this maps to a nice hardware implementation in an FPGA uh, that I'm not going to walk through over here. Uh, we used to call it slider. That's why it's called slider over here. And then we use the uh, Japanese sliding door name. And because you can count, you can, you can do this counting for all bit vectors and all sliding windows in a single clock cycle using uh, lookup tables, essentially, four input lookup tables. And for more detail, you can, uh, we released everything. So the source code is readable also. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about this more. OK, uh, so I'll continue, I think, since no one is stopping me yet. <laughs> uh, I will talk about one uh, last idea in this direction which I think in the end is the state of the art. And uh, we call the sneaky snake, uh, maybe not the best name, uh, but essentially uh, uh, the key observation here is that correct alignment is a sequence of non-overlapping long matches. Uh, this is maybe a mouthful, but it'll become more clear with uh, a pictorial example. Essentially, you want to do what we did with Shuji earlier uh, until you get uh, to a mismatch. And then you want to do it again, and then you want to do it again. Mismatch meaning error, let's say. Let, let me say error. Mismatch is a special meaning. And that's the idea over here. Basically, this problem ex actually exists already. Uh, if you know about the single net routing problem in VL side chip layout, we're basically mapping the approximate string matching problem to that single net routing problem. So that's why it's called the sneaky snake. You want to, you have an input, you have an output, uh, and you want to find the uh, uh, smallest number of obstacles. Uh, meaning stops over here to route one signal to the output over here, essentially. Okay, I'm going to explain the idea in a little bit more detail, but it turns out this is even more accurate than both Shuji and Gatekeeper, and it, because you don't now uh, you stop at when you get uh, when you get errors essentially, and it greatly accelerates uh, both the CPU-based aligners uh, significantly just on CPUs, 
Uh, and if you actually do the FPGA acceleration, you increase the speed ups more. And we have a GPU version of this also. So that's an algorithm that's mappable to essentially everything, uh, every interesting device. OK, so let's take a look at how this works. This is essentially a representation of the neighborhood matrix that we saw, uh, except it's in, uh, it's, in a, uh, uh, it's in a form where diagonals are rows over here. Uh, and you can see the main diagonal is here. This is the Hamming distance, and upper diagonal is uh, a one deletion, as we discussed, two deletion, three deletions, and then lower ones are one insertion, two insertion, three insertion. So let's take a look at the structure of this a little bit. So if you think of ones, ones are really obstacles. These are mis uh, things that mismatch, right? So you can, you can think of them as dark shades over here where you need to stop. So you can think of the problem as a place where you enter and then you can route along the white ones nicely and you have to stop at black ones and then write, route again along the white ones and then stop at black ones and then route, write again along the white ones. And you have only some number of tolerable errors as we discussed, let's say your number of errors, but error budget is three. You should be able to go from entrance to the exit without exhausting your error budget, essentially. That's the idea. So basically, you start, the snake starts by examining all possible locations and figures out the longest white stretch. In this case, you go to this place, four, right? And then you repeat the same thing. And then you, of course, you saw one error, so you decrement the error count. And then you do repeat the same thing in the next part. Clearly, you can go from here to here. That's good. So you uh, basically have another string, uh, streak or four over here, and then you decrement the error count. And then you can go from here to here, and then you reached essentially the exit at this point. So, and then error count also uh, gets reduced. So with three errors, you're able to route uh, uh, this way. So, and all of this can be actually done on the fly and also built on the fly as well. Uh, you don't need to do necessarily uh, pre-processing because you're really building uh, only these portions that you need on the fly, essentially, by, of course, examining uh, what you have seen. So black ones, you don't need to continue. The white ones, you keep continuing, essentially. That's the idea. OK, so that's the idea. I'm not going to go through this in more detail. And you can probably guess why this is more accurate, because we're looking at a variable size window depending on when we see the first error, as opposed to fixed size window in the previous case, Shuji, and as opposed to the entire uh, read, which is really inaccurate, as we discussed earlier. OK, this, again, leads to a, a, a nice FPGA implementation that I'm not going to talk about over here. But this leads to the highest speed ups. I didn't talk about the uh, short. I already gave you the short read mapping speed up. But even for long sequences, this leads to very nice speed ups compared to the best state of the art mapper. So uh, today, we have mapper, uh, mappers that use long reads, like 10k base pairs, or 100k base pairs, or million k base pairs, a million base pairs, actually. And you see that the speed ups that we get compared to those mappers are actually quite high, especially with smaller error rates. So this is what I mean by today, we're not good at handling very high error rates. So as you go to the very high error rates, the accuracy uh, or the false positive rate of this uh, filter that I mentioned increases a lot. As a result, performance benefits reduces. But you can imagine what are the error rates. So this is a 10K base pair. Uh, error rates has to be, let's say, 1,200. Uh, to not get a lot of performance benefit over here, which is 2x over here. So error rate is really uh, about 12% in this case, which is much better than anything we have today, actually. Uh, but we really want to scale to higher error rates in the end, in my opinion. OK, so this is another mapper that's actually used in Minimap 2. We don't do as well compared to Minimap 2 mapper, but we're still quite good, as you can see over here. Uh, with the error rates that are used in the field today, we get actually uh, to 20, uh, 27x or 17x speed up. Uh, OK. I'm not going to talk more about this, but this is a sneaky snake. So uh, let me also quickly cover genasm, uh, if you have time. Uh, I don't know how fast we're going, but or if people have questions, I'm happy to take questions also. OK, so I'm going to go. Uh, so this is a complete different approach that we've taken, actually. We wanted to rethink approximate string matching. Uh, Essentially, approximate string matching is actually used in many different parts, read mapping, for example. And uh, it clearly leads to a significant portion of read mapping as well. Uh, and our goal in this work was to extract approximate string matching uh, with a fast and flexible framework uh, such that we can actually use it in multiple steps of the genome sequence analysis pipeline, as well as text analysis pipeline. Basically, we wanted to extract approximate string matching in general, uh, as opposed to in a bioinformatics specific manner, as we've done earlier over here. 
And uh, the idea, uh, it's, it's really the first ASM acceleration framework, in my opinion. Uh, this is based on the BITAP algorithm, which I don't have time to uh, go through, actually. It was developed by some ETH folks in 1990s. And uh, we, covered, oh, no, we covered it in our seminar, so many people know about that. Oh, OK. OK, you covered it. That's nice. <laughs> We, we actually, somebody presented your work, Genasm. Yes. Oh, okay, you covered Genasm, not, not the BITAP. Okay, so I'm going to maybe go through relatively quickly. Uh, so essentially, BITAP is nice because it uses fast and simple bitwise operations to do approximate string matching, but it has some downsides also. It's not scalable. It also doesn't perform the traceback that's much needed uh, to actually get uh, the, di uh, the differences uh, between two strings, exact differences between two strings. Uh, so we basically co-design a new version of BITAP uh, with power and area efficient hardware accelerators. So let me go over the hardware design very quickly. Essentially, we have a distance calculation accelerator that generates bit vectors and performs edit distance calculation with the modified version of BITAP algorithm. And then an accelerator that performs traceback, because I think traceback is very hard without an accelerator uh, with the, with in purely in software. And it, it basically assembles the optimal alignment in the end. And they communicate with some hardware, as you can see. I'm not going to go over this. You can read the paper, and if, pe if people have covered it, that's great, actually. So uh, in the end, the uh, distance calculator is a systolic array-based accelerator. Uh, it tries to minimize the memory accesses, like any systolic array. And you can see the hardware is relatively simple. And it, uh, it puts its results into these SRAMs that are read by the traceback accelerator, which looks like this. And traceback accelerator essentially figures out the different kinds of uh, changes that happen between the two strings, and then basically computes uh, uh, it's an alignment score, essentially, that's used. And you can read the paper for more detail. Unfortunately, bioinformatics folks keep using interesting uh, names like CIGAR. It's essentially called an alignment score, how good an alignment is, basically. Uh, and it can be clearly a function of uh, the weights that you assign to matches, mis insertions, deletions, and substitutions, depending on what you're trying to examine. So in the end, it makes sense for this to be very, a very configurable accelerator, such that you can actually uh, outputs different types of, or, or uh, evaluate different types of alignment scores. So it's very simple logic in the end, uh, and it, because it's very much bitwise uh, based. And I'm not going to go through this in detail. And we, done, uh, we essentially uh, uh, did an RTL design. Currently, we are doing an FPGA mapping of this, actually, which is harder than it actually looks, uh, because it's a bit more complicated than the earlier ideas that we have discussed. Uh, but in the end, the area and power is not very high. But there are a lot of use cases also. Uh, clearly, uh, pre-alignment filtering we've talked about. But you can also use this as a read aligner itself as well. Again, I'm not going to talk about these. But you can also do this, uh, use this for edit distance calculator as well. But we discuss all of these in paper. And we show essentially significant speed ups and energy reduction compared to state-of-the-art software as well as hardware accelerators. And you can see that it's actually better than Shuji. Uh, in terms of pre-alignment filtering. And we're comparing to Sneaky Snake right now, but it's probably not going to be not as good as Sneaky Snake, in my opinion, unless we do an FPGA mapping uh, of this uh, at this point. So these are, this is actually concurrent work with Sneaky Snake. That's why we compared to Shuji over here. OK. Uh, do we have time to cover uh, the last part, processing in memory, which is probably even closer to my heart? <laughs> yes, yeah, yes. Let's go ahead. You, you go ahead, and if somebody has to leave, then. Yeah. OK, sure. If people have questions, I'm happy to stop also. OK, so basically, in the end, uh, doing everything that we've discussed, all of these are basically limited by DRAM bandwidth. So if you look at the Shuji paper, Sneaky Snake paper, they all occupy a small fraction of the FPGA area because a small accelerator that's designed very carefully saturates your memory bandwidth because you don't have enough memory bandwidth. In fact, we recently ported Sneaky Snake to HBM-based FPGAs, even though performance has improved a lot. We're still bottlenecked by the HBM bandwidth over there, although HBM clearly supplies a lot more bandwidth. Uh, and that's true for earlier algorithms as well. So basically, the solution direction that we've been pursuing is processing in memory can alleviate the bottleneck. Uh, but we need to design mapping and filtering algorithms to fit processing in memory. So if you look at the filtering algorithms that we discussed that are hash table based, uh, they don't fit as nicely uh, to processing in memory because you need to do a lot of hash table lookups, a lot of dependence memory access, et cetera. Of course, you could accelerate them using near data processing, et cetera. Uh, but I think there is a better way of representing the reference genome, as well as uh, doing bitwise operations as much as possible in processing in memory systems or processing near memory systems so that you can get good results. So this is another example of algorithm architecture co-design clearly. 
And I'm going to give you one example thing that we have done. It's called Grim Filter. It's essentially uh, pre-alignment filtering like we've discussed, but it's really specialized for processing in memory. And uh, there are multiple ideas over here. Oh, sorry about that. My computer has a mind of its own today. Uh, basically, we represent the reference genome in a different way so that, such that it's processing in memory friendly. And I'm going to introduce this very quickly. Uh, we basically partition the genome in, into large sequences called bins. You can see these are bins. And you represent each bin with a bit vector that holds the occurrence of all permutations of a small string or called token in the bin. So let's take a look at this. So we have this bit vector that represents all possible tokens. These are five MERS, let's say, strings of uh, length five, all possible strings of length five with the alphabet that we have in genomics. Uh, and you can see that uh, we have a bit vector that represents the existence of those possible strings in the bin of the reference genome. So this basically says that a string of substring of uh, five A's exists in this bin. Uh, AAC doesn't exist, AAT exists, dot, dot, dot. And then you have a bit vector. OK, I've already said uh, what this is saying. And to account for the matches that straddle the bins, you employ, we employ overlapping bins. That uh, needs to be done clearly if you want to be accurate. Uh, and a read now always falls completely within a single bin if you do that. And then we basically generate these bit vectors. Clearly, you can pre-process the genome to generate these bit vectors, right? Uh, you basically go through the genome and set the bits associated with a bin to one if, if that particular substring exists in that bin. So hopefully, the bin is not all, way, all ones, clearly, right? But it's possible, right? Uh, because you may, one bin may have all ones. Another bin may have uh, uh, a different concentration, as we've discussed earlier, uh, which we took advantage of because of the uh, different distribution of KMERS uh, in different pieces of the genome. OK, so now uh, this is what your genome representation looks like. So bin 1 is represented like this. Uh, each token has a bit associated uh, with it inside the bit vector associated with that bin. Bin 2 is represented like this. Bin 3 is represented like that, 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 that. And you do it basically for the entire reference genome. And hopefully, you select uh, your bit vector size uh, and the bins uh, such that they fit your memory. That's the idea, basically. So if your memory size is 4 gigabytes, for example, uh, you can select the numbers such that uh, you can have a memory footprint that's less than 4 gigabytes. So 4 gigabytes is a little bit pessimistic, but uh, we, we've done it in this work. Uh, and then checking a bin becomes relatively simple, basically. So uh, how, do, how do we determine whether to discard potential match locations in a given bin prior to alignment? Basically, do the filtering. This is the read sequence that we have. It's a read. It could be 300 base pairs, let's say. We basically tokenize it. You get the all possible tokens overlapping for higher accuracy. And then you read the bit vector from memory for, that bit, uh, for, a, for a given bin. You have to do it across all bins clearly in the end. Sorry about that. I have a minor thing here. <laughs> OK. No, OK. OK. And then uh, we match the tokens to the bit vector uh, over here. Basically, for each bit vector, for a given bit vector, uh, we query the bit vector to figure out whether uh, the tokens that we get from the read are actually ones. And then we sum them up. Or you have a sum function, basically. In this case, we do summing. I think there's a more accurate function, which we haven't examined, really. And in the end, if the sum is greater than some threshold, you say there are too many uh, mismatches you discard. Otherwise, uh, you, you, you send it. Uh, oh, sorry. If it's less than some threshold, you discard, because you say that not enough of these tokens in this read exist in this particular bin, meaning that this read is not going to exist in this bin. So I don't, I don't want to go and do alignment in this bin. Otherwise, you go and do the alignment uh, in the bin. So that's the idea. This is another filtering mechanism, as you see. And then you integrate this in, into a read mapper very quickly. Uh, read mapper uh, essentially uh, gets the read sequence and all potential seed locations. And then you basically check uh, which locations actually match or mismatch, depending on the filter outcome. And then we only do the alignment on things that match the filter. And then edit distance calculation is eliminated significantly, like earlier filtering mechanisms. So hopefully this is clear. So uh, the nice thing is, uh, these are simple operations. Uh, you need to do a sum of all bits corresponding to each token in the read. And uh, you need to do comparisons against threshold to determine whether to align. It's highly parallel. There are many, many bins. And it's memory bound also, given the frequent access to large bit vectors. Uh, it turns out it's memory bound. And this maps nicely to 3D stack DRAM. 
It could also map nicely to uh, in-memory processing mechanisms like AMBIT, uh, for example, even though we didn't examine it much over here. Uh, but basically, we did it in the logic layer of 3D stacked memory. Uh, and clearly, other 3D, th there are many 3D stack technologies, and other th uh, true 3D stack technologies are under development. So I'm going to go through these slides relatively quickly. But basically, logic layer enables uh, simple logic to be uh, implemented, and you have extremely high bandwidth and uh, low latency access to DRAM layers. And you can basically store your bins nicely in these banks and subarrays such that you can uh, get exploit the high bandwidth in the logic layer so that you can check many, many bins in parallel. OK, so basically, let's take a look at how we lay out the bins. So uh, in, the, in this bank over here, uh, we basically lay out the bins this way. So this is our bin 0, bit vector for bin 0, bit vector for bin 1, bin 2, bin t minus 1. And then you go to the next bank uh, and start with bin t, go to 2t minus 1. And then you basically keep doing this, as you can see. So you can store as many bins as uh, you have uh, banks and columns in a bank. Uh, and you can see that these are the tokens over here. So basically, uh, the layout of these bit vectors enables filtering many bins in parallel. You can search for a given token across many, many bins, as many as you can store. Uh, and uh, the, the per vault uh, grain filter logic is also very, very simple. As you can see, you, you need to have an accumulator, a comparator, and an incrementer. Uh, and then, of course, you need to store the bitmax uh, that you get. It's very customized logic, as you can see. OK, so there are many more details uh, in our paper. Uh, I'm going to skip the methodology over here. But we basically look at, since we're changing the algorithm, this actually improves the, uh, improves the accuracy of the filter as well. And we compare it to state of the art at that time. But basically, this leads to significant performance benefits compared to uh, prior filters. I believe we can actually get even more. But we didn't really optimize the design over here. Uh, and we were also a bit limited by the memory sizes we examined. So we, we looked at a 4 gigabyte memory. Uh, but if you look at, I mean, we didn't do the study, but I think if you look at a 64 gigabyte memory, for example, uh, I believe our accuracy will be much better uh, because your bins uh, will be much better distinguished uh, from each other. You can store many, many different bins. Uh, in this case, we had only 200 bins, for example, to represent a 3.2 billion base pair reference genome, right? Which is not that uh, great in that sense. But still, you get significant performance improvement, as you can see. And uh, I'm not going to go through this, but this leads to a better, more accurate filter also. OK. So I think this is uh, the last thing uh, I'm going to cover uh, based on prior work. So I'm not going to cover these, but we do a lot of work on processing in memory. Uh, I'm going to skip a lot of these over here. I think, actually, a lot of the uh, genome sequence analysis are moving to graph-based processing today. And I think uh, we've done some work in graph processing, which I didn't, it doesn't exactly fit. Uh, the graph-based genome analysis. But we are looking into right now how to do graph-based genome analysis much more efficiently in memory also. And I think this is a very interesting problem. And if you're interested in processing in memory, we've recently written some papers about it. Uh, uh, and this was published. This is going to be published in 2021. And I think this is uh, the most recent work that we have done. Uh, OK, I'm going to skip that one. So let me talk a little bit about future opportunities, because we haven't talked at least explicitly as much about these. I think. Uh, the future is actually even more exciting, I think, because of these devices uh, that look like this. So these devices didn't exist when we actually started working on this. We were dreaming in 2007, for example, and we said we want embedded devices that can do everything. And uh, uh, Oxford Nanopore introduced this device in 2014. And these devices are very capable, not as capable as uh, the earlier device, large devices that we uh, discussed. But still, it's quite good. As you can see, it's embedded. Uh, the difference for, from high throughput, earlier high throughput sequencing technologies, is, these are called second generation sequencing technologies, which were short, which had short reads uh, and low error rates, is that uh, nanopore sequencing is essentially much less expensive and they have long read lengths. Actually, a 2 million base pairs is more common today. They're portable and they produce data in much more real time. Uh, they're, uh, as we will see in a little bit also. And uh, I mean, uh, just to survey some of these more recent ones, you can also scale them up clearly. This is a single device over here. And then you can actually uh, have many, many more devices at the same time. Of course, you need to pay more. You can buy this simple device for 1,000 bucks. And maybe this uh, a little bit more scalable device for 5,000 bucks. Sorry about this. I don't know what happened. And then the prices keep increasing. Uh, 
And just for comparison, read length is very high over here. Uh, these are some of the uh, devices from Illumina, at least, uh, the second generation based sequencing. They're still very useful, uh, as you can see, because, uh, well, this doesn't show it, but error rates here are about 99 plus percent. Uh, error rates are less than 1%, whereas here, error rates are maybe 5 to 10%. It's reducing, but uh, maybe it's not going to reduce uh, as close to 1% uh, or less. But you can also see that these are more expensive. Anyway, uh, nanopore sequencing is interesting because it's a fundamentally different technology. Essentially, you have a nanoscale hole through which you pass the DNA strand. Uh, and the scalability is limited by how small you can make this nanoscale hole, of course, and how less error prone you can make that nanoscale hole. And essentially, ionic current passes through these nanopores. And uh, when the DNA strand passes through the nanopore, it essentially perturbs the ionic current. It leads to a change in current. And the sequencer measures that change in current. And that change is used to identify the bases uh, with the help of different electrochemical structures of the different bases. So uh, different bases essentially lead to different perturbations in the end. Uh, and it's a statistical process. It's, uh, it's error prone. As a result, you get much, more, much higher error rate. But you can see that this is much more scalable uh, compared to uh, the, the light-based technology that we discussed earlier. And also there are other advantages. They don't require any labeling of the DNA. They don't require any amplification also. Well, at least some slight amplification they do require. Uh, I'm, we already discussed this. And they allow sequencing of very long reads in the end. And clearly they're portable, low cost, and high throughput. Now the downside is uh, high error rate. So computationally, they're still quite intensive actually. Uh, so as a result, the computational tools have a critical role to overcome these high error rates somehow. The way people do overcome these high error rates is uh, today they increase coverage. For example, if you were sequencing uh, 30x a single genome, maybe you would be sequencing 200x in this case to build some confidence, which means that you're increasing the computational burden, even though the technology is very nice, uh, but it has this error rate problem. Uh, and also, I think faster tools are critically needed to take better advantage of the real-time data production capability. So these nanopore sequencers, even though they're capable of uh, uh, like in the field sequencing of anything, uh, because the computational capability is not integrated into the device, uh, or uh, sometimes people actually send the data to data centers that are much, much farther away. So they move a lot of data uh, in the field. Uh, to actually uh, analyze the data that is produced by uh, these devices. So basically, in my opinion, we're not really taking advantage of the capability of the devices today because we're processing the data far away. So we need to do perhaps much better, faster, real-time data analysis. But again, this is not just a hardware problem. It's really an algorithmic problem uh, as, we've just, as we've been discussing so far. So we did an analysis of these nanopore sequencing technology and the tools, and we covered the entire uh, genome assembly pipeline that's based on nanopore. And it's, it's very interesting, actually. You get the raw signal data. And then uh, you need to call the basis, meaning uh, you need to identify whether what you're getting is an ACTG, right? And there are very interesting algorithms. A lot of them are neural network-based, actually, RNN-based uh, algorithms uh, that are used uh, to call the basis. And unfortunately, they're very slow. <laughs> so base calling actually takes a lot of time. Sorry, I don't know what, what's happening still. Uh, and after that, there's another step. You find the retread overlaps. So graph-based mapping tools actually are used here. And then you do a draft assembly. And then you do some read mapping and then to, to polish the assembly. So there's actually a, a sequential step-by-step -step analysis over here. And clearly, read mapping is very important uh, uh, because actually some of the fundamentals are employed here and as well, some, some of them are here as well. But base calling turns out to be one of the bottlenecks also in nanopore analysis. So you, uh, if, you're, if you're interested, you can take a look at the paper that we've written. I'm not yeah. going to go through all this data over here. Yes. Can, if, you, if you allow me, in every box here uh, in the last two years, there are a couple of new names that appear in every box. There's okay. a new base color, and there is a new assembly tool, and there is a new... <laughs> I mean, that's amazing, you know, how fast it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, I mean, our paper was written in 2018, and there are already new versions. Yeah. Actually, these, these are not the state of the art, I would say. Oh, it's, yeah. it's a good start, certainly, but there are certainly new base colors that we are looking at right now. Uh, yeah. And clearly, base calling has improved, but still, it's a bottleneck in nanopore sequencing. But I agree. I think the field is moving fast because people are realizing that uh, the tools that we are using are a big bottleneck, certainly. OK, so I'm not going to go through this in detail, but you can look at the paper. And the paper is linked from here. But basically, let's go, let's go back to where we began, essentially. So this was our dream.
from 2007, right? We wanted an embedded device that can perform comprehensive genome analysis within a real time. So the doctor asks the question and one second later gets an answer and administers the right drug and the patient survives, right? That sounds nice. Are we there yet? I don't think so, basically. <laughs> There's a lot more to do, in my opinion. Uh, and I think uh, clearly energy and performance and latency are important and there's a huge memory bottleneck over there, uh, but there's also algorithmic uh, and architectural bottlenecks. And we haven't even touched security and privacy issues as well. I think that's, that was also very, very interesting, but that's a completely orthogonal uh, direction over here. But I think these uh, devices are getting smaller and smaller. Uh, I mean, this is something that you can plug into your cell phone, for example, again, from Oxford Nanopore. Uh, but again, the analysis that you can do is limited. So uh, this is one good reason. Uh, actually, if there's one benefit of COVID-19, uh, I can have a better motivation uh, for these genome analyses in my lectures. And right. everybody, everybody quickly empathizes with this <laughs> for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, I think the other uh, reasons are good to empathize with also, but uh, I guess this is much worse felt clearly. But uh, clearly people are actually doing uh, uh, sequencing of COVID-19 as well. I'll very quickly discuss some directions over here. Uh, people are doing whole genome sequencing and data analysis to understand the genome and its variants, et cetera, do diagnostic tests, et cetera. But there are even more interesting and heavyweight analysis uh, that are potentially even better in the longer run, basically. You can track the mutation of the virus, for example, uh, or you can actually explore the genes of infected patients. You can do these whole gene uh, or uh, essentially genome-wide analysis studies, right, uh, that can uh, enable us to understand why some people get more severe symptoms than others and why some people respond to treatments or versus not respond to treatments, et cetera. Uh, so this, these are slides borrowed from Oxford Nanopore. Uh, I think the quickest steps, as you can see, takes about seven hours, according, uh, according to them. I haven't verified this uh, using uh, at least some sort of Nanopore sequencing device. And you can see that sequencing is only one hour, according to them again. And according to them, analysis is only one hour, but this is a very simple analysis uh, for detection of, uh, uh, of COVID-19, I think. And clearly preparation takes longer over here, uh, but there are some, some costs that you, need to, uh, that you need to pay. But I think the really interesting parts are over here. Again, these are slides that are borrowed from uh, Oxford Nanopore because I think they put a nice thing over here. Uh, I think what is really interesting is this metagenomic nanopore sequencing that they have, that they outline over here. Uh, how, uh, I'm, which I mentioned earlier, actually, characterizing and also more whole human genome sequencing, investigate what might cause different responses to the virus, uh, what might lead to mutations, what might not lead to mutations, uh, and also what, uh, what might cause different responses to the treatments as well. And these are much more heavyweight analyses. Uh, and you need to actually now compare human genomes as opposed to just virus genomes, right, in this case. But I think the future is very bright as you can see. And I'm not taking sides, of course, but Oxford Nanopore is clearly uh, uh, a technology that can enable this in the field. Uh, and I think it'd be nice if we could have devices that we can carry in our pockets where we could privately do these analyses without exposing it to uh, the world uh, in a very quick manner. And people who are practitioners in the field who are experts can do this analysis when it's, it's, it's needed. And I think it's going to be needed even more into the future. So let me conclude. Uh, I'm going to use essentially the same slide that I start with. I believe, and hopefully uh, I've given you some evidence that system design for bioinformatics is a critical problem uh, because it has large scientific, medical, societal, and personal implications. And uh, I've covered a key step in bioinformatics, which is genome sequence analysis. And even within that key spe step, we focused on read mapping. For example, we didn't focus on base calling at all. Uh, I mentioned very briefly, right? And uh, I covered uh, my personal journey, let's say, uh, on recent ideas in accelerating read mapping. I believe many future opportunities exist. Hopefully I've given you some examples of this, especially with new sequencing technologies, I think, and also especially with new applications and use cases. And I think in the end, you need to do better algorithm architecture co-designs for this. And I'll point you to this short paper that we have invited to write. Uh, again, there's a lot more that's covered, even though it's shorter. Uh, because it doesn't go into as much detail as I did here. And I think processing in memory technologies actually are a very good fit going into the future. Uh, and again, processing in memory uh, taken more broadly, I think processing inside the sequencer uh, is another example of processing near the data. And uh, memory is just one place where you can incorporate processing capability, but certainly processing inside the sequencer 
whether in the sequencer's memory or inside the sequencing, uh, depending on how tightly coupled you want to be with the sequencer, of course, uh, is very, very interesting going into the future also. And yeah, uh, I guess I'll mention that I gave an IDM tutorial on memory-centric computing systems also. That's important. And we actually uh, have a lot of lectures in my computer architecture class on, uh, sorry, why, this, why is this moving? I don't know, on uh, genomics as well. And we have a special uh, genomics project course, actually two of them uh, that we have delivered where students are working on uh, algorithm architecture co-designs hands-on using FPGAs or simulators when it comes to processing in memory. Actually with processing in memory, we now have uh, real processing in memory, well, uh, devices like from UpMem that essentially add uh, general purpose cores to banks in a DRAM chip. And we've actually been experimenting with them uh, with different applications and genome analysis, one application uh, where we see interesting benefits uh, also, even with a, a relatively limited processing in memory engine like uh, what they have, because they don't have communication capability across the cores uh, that reside in different banks, for example. Okay, so I will acknowledge people who have contributed to this. Uh, John Alkan, clearly, who we've been collaborating a lot with, and many students. Mohammed, uh, who, who has done a PhD thesis together with me and John Alkan, uh, co advised by us. And Damla is finishing up his PhD thesis, and Jeremy is also doing a thesis on this topic. And people who funded us, uh, I hope they keep funding us, and acknowledge my research group. And we recently released a newsletter of the work that we've done, which covers some of the other works that I didn't get a chance to describe much uh, in this talk. So if you're interested, you can take a look at it. With that, I think I will conclude. I'm happy to take any, any questions. Oh, no, I have a maybe foolish, but uh, <clears throat> fundamental question. There seem to be in the whole sequencing issue two underlying uh, assumptions. One is uh, related to errors. After all, if you knew that there are no errors, you don't need to sequence anything. You know, it's the same as the reference. So clearly you want differences or else there is zero information. Mm. So what's, <clears throat> when is it an error and where is it a legitimate uh, difference? Mm. That's one question. The other is related somewhat. There seems to be an underlying assumption <clears throat> whereby the, the correct sequencing is the one in which you differ the least from the reference. Now, it's probably true, but it <laughs> philosophically doesn't have to be true. Yeah. So these are very good questions. So I think the first, let me handle the first one first. Basically, where do the errors come from, right? Uh, so I think, uh, I think when you're saying errors, you're referring to machine errors, right? Essentially, uh, machine has... Uh, some problem, it didn't identify a base correctly. No, this I understand, but what you see is a difference. You don't know whether it's a machine error. Absolutely, or a yes. A difference. So yeah, yeah. the question is there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that's a great question. So basically, uh, uh, so what people do in the field is they try to understand the machine, meaning they try to understand what kind of errors are more possible in the machine. Uh, for example, I think uh, nanopores uh, machines, uh, at least uh, some generation, was more vulnerable to substitutions, meaning uh, you wouldn't get deletions more, but you would get substitutions more. So if you understand that more, then you would treat that more carefully uh, in the downstream analyses. And they also try to correct as much as possible. So that's one approach that people take. They try to basically uh, not give the same weight to different type of errors based on an understanding of the machine that they develop. The second approach that take is uh, essentially, they sequence more. So you don't sequence the same. Uh, you don't sequence only once, but you sequence 200 times. And you try to build some confidence so that hopefully the errors of the machine, uh, assuming they're somewhat random, and if you take into account the correction that you do, machine-specific corrections you do, uh, you can do it carefully, basically. So I think machine-related errors, in the end, uh, those are the two solutions that people employ to minimize them. But again, your point is well taken. Not all of the errors that you can, uh, you can get rid of this way, I think. Uh, but I think uh, with the smaller error rates uh, like Illumina, less than 1% error rate or less than 0.5% error rate, it's getting better day by day. Machine errors is becoming a less of a problem. With Nanopore, it's, it's clearly a bigger problem. Uh, and I think we should really strive to develop better machines. <laughs> no question about that. Uh, but they do uh, muddy the waters a little bit in terms of the downstream analysis. 
uh, and I don't have a great answer in terms of what you do when, the, when, when, when you cannot distinguish, right? You cannot distinguish, you cannot distinguish, right? Uh, 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 you, you sequence again, uh, but that, that leads to uh, even more uh, cost. Uh, the second question is uh, essentially uh, whether you want to find the uh, closest matches. And I agree with you in this case. So I think uh, what you try to do is you, want, you find the closest matches within some uh, uh, error rate, right? E, e, as we've discussed. Let's assume that machine has no errors. Uh, everything is a difference between reference and yourself. Uh, that's exactly why I think people are really interested in increasing E, what your comment uh, is about. Uh, I think uh, people know that exact matches are, are not clearly good. Uh, maybe 2% E is not good enough for some downstream studies because clearly some, error, uh, some, some of the uh, differences that you want to identify are much greater than 2%. Like I showed you for autism, right? It's, uh, I, it was, I think, 593 kilobytes uh, or kilobit uh, deletion that you have in, uh, in chromosome 16. So I think uh, sometimes when people know that that's the case, what they do is they do very targeted analyses, uh, meaning they basically look for that deletion. <laughs> uh, but again, this is not extremely scalable, right? You, if, you, if you have 10,000 different uh, things like this, you have to run 10,000 different analyses uh, that are targeted like this. Uh, Again, I don't necessarily have a good answer, but I agree with you. Sometimes you want to look for much larger differences than uh, what current mappers allow you to uh, do. And uh, the difficult part, I think, is discovery, really. Uh, meaning if your mapper is not giving you larger uh, um, matches with larger error rates, then you don't know what you're missing, right? When you're, if you're a scientist, for example, you're trying to figure out uh, this uh, correlation between a key disease and uh, a, 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 let's say uh, a variation that happens uh, that's larger than what your mapper can uh, report to you, uh, then you would be missing that. And I don't, I don't think anyone has a good answer uh, to that. People try to find those things. Uh, that's why I think uh, uh, wet lab studies are still there and people are finding things using wet lab studies, right? <laughs> well, uh, I guess this is where you need the, the novel assembly, right? Uh, that's true, yes, you know, that's where you need certainly you know, assembly, but uh, there are also errors over there as well. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's why I think in the end, uh, higher error rates uh, are good to, good to target. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, if no more questions, then I guess uh, we should thank you. Thank Honor. Thank you very much.